Good evening hey, and welcome to the Sanctum Secorum Reading Room. Whether you are new to the literary world of Appendix N, a diehard fan of the genre, or even just tuning in to see how certain titles tie into a particular set of role-playing games, we invite you to join us as we dive into the history and influence of Appendix N. We'd like to open our library to you and inspire readers to explore these new worlds. And, and uh, <laughs> We're going to have a couple of things coming up in the next hour that will definitely invite you to uh, share our library. Uh, I am Keeper Jet, and with me is Keeper Bob. Hey, everybody. And I'd like to take this quick moment to remind you all about the channel points here in Twitch. You can use them to do things like highlight your messages, <clears throat> never your books, um, highlight messages, send emotes, um, you know, ask for random facts because Bob's full of those. And with that, tonight we are continuing our exploration of the women of Appendix N with a dive into the stories of the people with Pilgrimage by Zena Henderson. They look human, feared as witches and demons. They possess superhuman powers. They can read minds free objects from gravity and fly through space. They live alone and outcast in Cougar Canyon. These are the people marooned on this planet by the crash of their interstellar vehicle in the distant past. The people are never free of a sense of strangeness in this world and a yearning for the home they have half forgotten. These are the chronicles of their arrival on this world, their estrangement from it, and their ultimate acceptance of their poignant exile. Yeah, this is, wow, this, this is a good book. Yeah, it's. I liked it better than Dolphins of Altair. Let me start there. <laughs> okay, well, we didn't have any suicide bomber dolphins, so it I was mean, certainly it, less, kind of less a, disquieting. A but... <laughs> right? well, that, that, that was kind of just disquieting. Um, but we also didn't have any mad scientist characters and overall it was wholesome this this is this is this is definitely uh, a far cry from what most folks these days would call science fiction right um, but i think that goes back to zena henderson herself right and and who she was um, and and how she was raised and, and the way she spent her life. I mean, she was born Zena Clarson Henderson, Zena with one N. She took the, uh, the second N in the 50s. And I mean, she was born, raised, and died in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I, I, I gotta say, she probably just got tired of being called Zena. That's fair, right? <laughs> then again, maybe, maybe, maybe she was born Zena. Maybe Zena went to Zena. I don't know. Or Zion. But, anyway. but I mean, but, but she was a teacher. She taught in, in Arizona, Connecticut, France, and even in a Japanese internment camp in Arizona during World War II. Teaching was her life, right? I mean, that that so shows in in all of these stories. And she started she started reading sci-fi when she was like 12 with with influences like Heinlein and Bradbury and Asimov and Clement and, and all of that carries through to her writings, right? Yeah, I, I will say um, I was really intrigued by some of the terminology used in her writing and the fact that there are even more stories than this. Um, the in-gathering uh, the Complete People Stories was published in 1995 after her death, and it includes previously uncollected material from the same It has uh, the last series. story of the people. It does. Yeah. It, there was an unpublished story. Yeah, I, I, I kind of want to go back and, and find all of those original uh, magazines, you know, fantasy and science fiction, uh, Galaxy. She even has stuff that appears in the Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Oh, that's cool. And well, uh, 
the follow-up to this particular book was uh, The People, No Different Flesh. That sounds a lot creepier than it probably is. I'm just saying. It, yeah, maybe. And and I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment out to say, hello, Raid. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> Keep the love flowing. Okay, so we've we've got this weird lady. Well, and, um, and you want to talk about, about the, the old pulps. Subjective, but... You want to talk about the old pulps. Her first story, I mean, was published in, in 1951, so not, not too far before the people stories. And it was called Come On Wagon in the December issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And it dealt with a man who had been abroad for years and he came home and the kids at home were kind of weird and gave him this weird feeling. And one of them couldn't understand why his little red wagon wouldn't follow him and play with him like a puppy. And that that actually, while, while a little funny, sounds a little creepy and probably sounds as creepy as the descriptions of the people. So it is probably just wholesome and good like everything else. But yep. uh, I didn't find the descriptions of the people creepy. I found them a little bit um, lackluster at times. Well, I mean, the, the descriptions but, of, of the books themselves, right? They oh, were called witches and demons. I mean, these are from the backs of the books. They really, really? sold this. It's like, yes, like ominous and creepy. And no, no, this is this is good, clean, wholesome fun, folks. Um, I mean, um, and this is. This is a, a woman who was one of the first female science fiction authors to to publish between you know between 1926 and 1960. She was one of the first like 200 female authors to do so. Um, she was nominated for a Hugo Award, and she never used a female suit or used a male pseudonym. Although I wouldn't necessarily have known the gender of Zena to begin with, but but she never used a, a blatantly male pseudonym like so many others um yeah that that part i really honestly that's one of the things that drew me to her and her writing i mean in comparison to some that we have reviewed who have used those pseudonyms and who have been forced to use those pseudonyms just to get anything published so it's kind of nice that she got out there on on her own merit if you will yeah um, but a lot of the reviews that I read were, you know, the, her writing exhibits warmth, gentleness, and a sense of the worth of human and non-human beings. And really, that's extremely timely with what was going on in the 60s at the time that she was writing all of this. Well, and and a lot of a lot of the things resonate today, right? I mean, sadly. Yeah. You can you you can see you can see her background. I mean, she was she was born and raised Mormon. She became a Methodist, and eventually she uh, joined an independent uh, Christian Charismatic Fellowship, sort of like the Pentecostals, right? So you know, she was she was raised Christian, and interestingly enough, the aliens from outer space are Christian as well. And uh, it, which or, or or oh no, they are they are Mormon. Well, kind of. I, I, I really get a strong Mormon feel from it. To be I, fair, Mormon, Mormons aren't just an Abrahamic faith. I, they I, are Christian. I understand that. I say this because the entire overtone of this book gave me this sense of um, nostalgia, but not for the religious aspect. Uh, that's why I'm stumbling over my words here. Um, I grew up in what was for the most part an undeveloped desert area. And we had the new Mormon missionaries that were out there. And so kids in my school were having to leave for lunch or go to seminary early in the morning and be late to school for that. And so it, it really, the, the cliquish feel about all of that really drove itself home especially considering most of what we are about to get into took place in the classroom and in a lot of ways the the society of the people the the self-imposed isolation echoes things like um like the Amish, although, I mean, they are not Amish, but, but it echoes that, no. that isolation and separatism, um, 
that that uh, that nearness and yet still apart reminds me of the Mennonite communities in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Yeah, yeah. Um, where where it's 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 yeah. different, but of the community. But they're they're a little further back. But pe- people know who they are. But they. They, they are. They, it it almost feels like it was set in um, in the setting of the Rifleman, because everything is so very far away and up a hill and down a hill in the desert canyons. And I, it 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 shows me that she did actually live in Tucson for all of the uh, the references to um, not just the landscape, but like this road becomes unpaved at a certain point. And I, I remember that sort of stuff from the early 80s, even outside Las Vegas. So it, it really, it helped immerse me because yeah. she wrote what she knew. Yeah, yes, she did. Oh my goodness, did she ever. And, and of course, you'll be beyond her books, there was the adaptation, right? There, there was. Uh, that's one of the first things people go to, actually, is the, the movie version of The People, which was made for TV in 1972 and starred William Shatner. The people have powers. Uh, uh, capital uh, P for powers too. Yes. That's yes, how you that, know it's got religious capital, overtones, capital right? Capital P for powers. <laughs> yeah, and, or, or weren't they like way, what was it, the, they, they called them something else. So they were the, like the, the ways and, and, and something else. Oh, there, there was... Uh, but they, they had a term the power as well um but didn't you say the movie was also available on primes it is it P's? is it <laughs> is indeed uh the people is available on uh, prime video so if you have amazon prime you can watch it for free it's a 1972 tv movie with william shatner that i haven't <laughs> watched so i don't know how good it is because so he's not he's not speaking for it right yes i'm not endorsing the movie but i am saying that it is out there and i probably will watch it tonight after the uh, the podcast version of the show goes out because it's got william shatner it can't be great but it doesn't have to be bad right? <laughs> i mean you could watch it tomorrow when i'm busy uh- <laughs> what fun is I- that if it's good, we enjoy it. If it's bad, we suffer together. Can we find Tales of, Tales of the Dark Side in from 1988 instead? Because her short story, Hush, became an episode. Oh. Mm-hmm. See, I know how to research too. <laughs> well, I know you know how to research too. I just didn't know that one of her stories had be, been an episode of Tales from the Dark Side. See, so she could write creepy-ish, apparently. Who knows? Or it was adapted to be so. Uh, I'd be really curious to see, especially with um, the two short story collections that uh, were specifically just her works, The Anything Box and Holding Wonder. And that's in addition to numerous anthologies that I'm not going to list by title here. You can you can Google her or look her up on Amazon. Now, Sky um, 2 has mentioned that the movie might make a great double bill with, with the Silver John movie, which is The Ballad of Hillbilly John. And I'll tell you, the music for one is going to be awesome. Yeah, that that movie is worth finding just for the opening soundtrack. Um, beyond Good that, luck eh, on both counts. Not so much, but but the first part, that first like two minutes with yeah. Hoyt Axton, good stuff. So just so, play that and then into the people, maybe. Um, Save yourself I mean, some time. Well, or or if you're going to sit through the people anyway, I, I can't vouch for how good one is over the other. So I, I can't throw anyone under the bus that way. But um, I should also ask uh, our Twitch viewers currently, uh, have you read any of the short stories involved here? Because we're about to ask you some questions about it. Well, we, we, we certainly, there are certainly questions that can be raised. Okay, I'm about to ask some questions because I've mentioned how reading this book has made me feel um did anybody else read some of this or or get any strong feeling from it um i was wondering um if it came across as wholesome to you guys to to you folks or were there moments of hope and positivity that came through or did it just make you absolutely cringe because of all of the overtones I am honestly, earnestly curious about this. 
Yeah, most you know, most of it struck me so nicely, but I really hated the wraparound text that was written for this book. Right? Oh, the, the, the intro. The, the the well, all the Leah story. That, Which was the goes, intro and the little bridges between. It, yeah, it's it's the bridge text that, that puts it all together. I think this would have been better as just a collection of short stories. I didn't think I didn't think it needed anything else to sort of explain it. And I mean, part of the Leah story is dark, right? I mean, without hope, getting ready to kill herself and leap off a bridge, only to find out that she leaps off the bridge, she's probably just going to break an ankle and won't die. But I mean, just yeah. that that hopelessness. And it really, I, I pushed my way through you know, Leah one. And when I got, when I got to the actual stories of the people, that's where it got interesting for me. That, that weird darkness just was sort of, out, it seemed out of place with the rest of the stories. I mean, I guess, I guess it was the sort of thing that maybe Leah needed to hear to, to try and turn her around, but wow she was determined it, to die it's honestly the bridge story is what made it more and more cultish for me because oh wait you have to come to the next gathering capital g um and you you have to listen to this person's testimony essentially it's like they had all of these people lined up to give sermons for lack of a better word on their experiences and how much being part of this group or people has changed their lives. Well, and, and the conceit was that they were they were recording these these memories. They were kind of archiving them. Was was the conceit? But uh, King Gidra's right. You know, in, in asking, was this wraparound story ever resolved? No, not really. Um, she just sort of listened to the last story, and maybe she lived. Um, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think she appears in the next collection. I could be wrong, but oof, it's just. And yeah, I, I, I will say the opening story wasn't thrilling, but I was absolutely just, it was maddening to see Karen's dialogue written the way it was. She was so spastic kept cutting herself off everywhere i mean there were m dashes all over the page <laughs> from, from an editorial point of view come on uh, that doesn't make me an, enticed to continue reading the book so i was very glad to see that karen calmed the heck down and actually spoke in some full sentences after that first night yeah yeah oh <laughs> But I mean, but once once you get into the actual stories, right? The actual stories are good. They're really good stories, and and, and Some yes, of them. Uh, I, I enjoyed most of them. Okay, um, Jordan, the last one was a little slow, and 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 perhaps yeah. and perhaps I'm just saying, perhaps the slowness of that story uh, did not play well with Leia, and maybe that's why we don't have a wrap up for the uh, for the bridging story. Oh, um, that's true. Maybe, well. Now, now I'm actually curious. She's, dang it, she's going to make me go to the next book. I'm curious to see if there's a pickup point. Well, so those next stories were all written like eight to 10 years later, right? I mean, there, this was, at the time, this was all of the people stories. And, and the next story is- five years between the, the publication, right? This one- Right, but this, yes, this book versus mm -hmm. the publication of the stories- Right. The next, the No Different Flesh, that collection was published five years later in 1966. Right. Re please recall that the last of these stories was published in like 59 or 58 or 59. So, so yeah, I mean, there was, there was definitely, there was, there was a gap. I mean, there, it was not something that directly picked up from one to the next to the next. Um, and from my understanding, if you're going to read the people stories, this is really the book to read. The, uh, the, the, second, the second book of stories is, is said to be not, not as, as strong as, as this collection is. Well, now that's but, an interesting take. But yeah, I mean, you know, she's, she's religious 
the stories definitely have religious overtones. She was a teacher. Oh, teachers are important in this. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either, right? I mean, teachers are important. Once more, right in what she knows. But what I what I really like is this isn't your, your standard, like, bug-eyed aliens and flying saucers story or your, your zap guns in space sort of stories. These are, I think one of the reasons this this book resonates so much is these are stories of immigrants right i mean they're they're good people with with amazing powers but really the amazing powers are there just to sort of pull you further into the story of of who these people are and and their day-to-day -day struggles well and their their struggles with being different or um encountering the other and again, very much a, a product of the time, but also done very tactfully and, and never, never with the, the, look, the demeaning uh, verbiage that yeah. so many other authors would refer to. You know, they're, they're not natives, they're not savages. They're, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're just different. Well, and, and the thing is, the, the differences they have not only make them fascinating, but it, it makes for engrossing reading. There's um, one of the stories, it is, give me a moment here. Um, I think it's Captivity, which has the, where everyone's asking, what's wrong with the Francher kid? Because uh, yeah. he, you know, yeah. he's troubled and he's doing all these things and you know he, he's poor. And, and so you already have sort of this, this narrative that, I mean, really, uh, it's sort of like a modern, it's sort of like a, a proto Harry Potter, right? He's, he's going to school, he's the outcast, he's weird, he's poor, he looks kind of funny, and yet he has magical powers. And, and what I like is, he uses those, he uses his powers like a real kid his age in his, in his mental state of being pissed off at everybody would do. Well, I'm just going to pull all the musical instruments out of the, out of the school and make them dance around and run away because I can. Because I can create the music with them Be and, 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 and use this power that my mother gave me. At well, and that was, that was what really gripped me was his description of, I hear music. I hear music, but I can't make that sound. And so he's saving all he's, you know, he's saving up all, all his money to buy a musical instrument so he can at least try. And then the then the the foster mother takes the money and spends it on a suit so he can look nice. And and, and there's and, that extra rebellion. All of this um, also leads me to add, she did mention at one point that he was half black in his heritage. Never mentioned which side was which, but his mother was a, a palm reader or a fortune teller at the, uh, or was, did they call her a seer? But she worked at the circus. She worked at the carnival. Yeah. Because because he was, Which they made were, him they were even weirder. Yeah, because, you know, if you want to. Especially to all these like Jethro's and. If and, you want to have a low social standing. Yeah. Carney yeah. in the 50s is pretty much, pretty much it, right? And, yeah, you could have skipped the skin tone. <laughs> and then, and then, as as he's introduced to someone who who understands and has power, and reveals to him the sound of the music in his head, and and tells him, "You will be able to do this. You will be able to craft this music." I mean, that in that one story, that that single story takes him essentially through most of the hero's journey right I mean, he didn't he didn't have a mentor who who had to die but but his parents were already gone so so he'd already sort of been on that road and it's it's very condensed it's it's very nice and neat and it's not told from his point of view so you're observing him as he does this mm -hmm. and he's not he's not a happy kid and and it shows but he has those moments and uh, it was just engrossing. I think my favorite of the stories was Pottage, where the teacher Melody comes into this town of really just socially stunted and quiet people. They're afraid 
to walk normally, they have to always shuffle the dirt and the leaves under their feet because they're afraid they might lose touch with the ground. And uh, one of the first powers that we learn of is lifting, where mm-hmm. the kids levitate themselves or objects. And in order to keep the children from lifting, they are taught at a very early age, they must always scuff the ground like their parents. And it had been going on for what, two or three generations there? Yeah, it was It was sort of like and... the people version of Footloose, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, it, it really was. I mean, you're, I, you're in this community where, that, where they but... couldn't sing, they couldn't dance, they had to walk shuffling their feet. It was It was so just- They couldn't have fun. Down. They weren't allowed to have fun because that might lead to them losing control of their powers. They had to be completely tightly laced. And it really harkens to you don't let other people find out that you are different or that you are other or that you have these powers because that's how you die well and and here's so instead you must try to conform to that wainscot society well and and here's the thing i think especially that story specifically might have drawn some inspiration from her time teaching in the japanese internment camp because there is a reason these people Whoa. fear as fear being seen as other. They are afraid of what will happen if people find out they are different. They are terrified. Yeah. And while the kids aren't, the parents are driving this into them. And and Jenna Henderson had seen what happens. Yeah. You know, she had seen that firsthand. And so this 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 whole thing comes along. And just as a as a as a gamer putting together like a, a weird little community like this sort of, a you know, a little, a little, little town, you know, maybe creepy. a little village near a town yeah. where, where, you know, the people are there, but they're always just sort of funny. And the way that the, the outsider niche of them or outsiderness of them, it, it, <laughs> it kind of put me to mind of, you know, the people of Innsmouth, the people of Innsmouth. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're there, but they're, different and there there were so many other threads that ran through that story that it had a, a great impact yes thank you Ans three you're right outsiderish out, outside outsiderishness that's it. i can pronounce words i swear to god words are hard it's all good but yeah that was that was another great story um or or error at where where the teacher miss uh, carmody is keeping her powers hidden because everywhere she goes she gets fired because someone walks in while she is mm-hmm. levitated up to get a book and and so or, or to hang a painting or something yeah and, and so they, they freak out and rather than tell everybody else she can fly which obviously you know people can't Mm-mm. do that so you can't <laughs> say that she would, she would be fired and so she she goes through this entire story expecting oh, i'm gonna get fired okay so so just tell me i'm fired i'm fired right and it's no, you're one of us. And so there, this earlier story shows you what happens when you reveal yourself to the right people. And then we roll into this story about the fear of revealing yourself to the wrong people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it makes me wonder, right? She was married in, Zena Henderson was married in 43 and divorced in 51. And I kind of, I kind of wonder what went on there, right? What what sort of things were going on there that also might have fed into her storytelling? Because she definitely wrote from life, other than the fact that she probably could not fly or, or things of well, that nature. I mean, never assume, right? Uh, wilderness was another fun one because that allowed the female reader to identify more with this woman who doesn't have power she's not one of the people well she has powers she's not one of the people she's developing this sense she almost comes across as schizophrenic at first because there's all these different voices described you know one of my voices say this some of my voices are crying in jubilation for this some of my voices are terrified to let anybody know this and so she's clearly got a little bit of something going on, right? But then she sees a kid lose control of her powers and the kid tells her about this guy that 
I can't name his name, but this is, you know, there's somebody helping me with it. And then she meets the same guy and That's Mr. Lowe. They she accuses or he I forget who tells which, but one of them says, Stop talking on top. I'm listening underneath. And so they were able to have these sub vocal or nonverbal conversations with each other. And that was that 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 was kind of a, a neat little romanticism of the powers, I thought. Well, and and Sky too in the chat brings up a, a really good point. She Zena Henderson seemed very familiar with with mental illness and and port and and portrayed things yeah. portrayed things akin to it in a sympathetic light as opposed to as opposed to your know, horrifying or mm-hmm. over exaggerated no it was very and, humane and the the struggles of of lucine as as she is she is traumatized by you know her power getting out of control more and more and more to the point where she she is literally at one point described as just being an animal because she is just responding on instinct because she can't even think anymore. And then when and, Mr. Lowe can't find her, no, she's here. Look for the animal. As he's scanning like the the mental wavelengths or something. And and as we as we going through all these stories and we learn that you know the people are are certainly scattered all about the southwest because the ship broke up and the pods landed in different places. And so there's different communities. And I forget the name of the the character. At at one point, um, the the main character and and Lo, you know, they they lift, and mm-hmm. one person sees them. But he's he's sort of the town drunk, and and nobody really thinks much of it. But as it turns out, he knows what's going on. You know, he he is he has been befriended by the people. He knows how to reach out to the people. Sure, they keep erasing his mind, <laughs> which is. Which is a little, little, you know, I'm looking at this guy, you know. A little less humane, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a drunk. Uh, nobody believes him. And maybe that's because people keep erasing his mind. There's shades of gravity falls there, right? The, the, yeah. The yeah. order of the hidden eye. And uh, so he goes back to, and talks to these people, the, you know, the original couple. Um, <laughs> let's talk about these names for a minute. Valency and Jemmy. Mm-hmm. We're, we're the first couple uh twyla was the francher kids uh i guess teenage love interest there mm-hmm. melody with an e at the end i i mean yeah valency carmody or carmody okay i mean a lot of these are names that i might have expected to see come up in golgotha maybe <laughs> It's just it may be very, right very old west well which which makes sense i mean that mm-hmm. that sort of that sort of ties in i can't re- can't it, remember it the name of the of the guy that was basically old man mcgucket but i mean yeah. he uh but he also had kind of he, he had an unusual yeah. name there's a lot of unusual names but and, and that particular aspect really pulled me out of feeling like it would be a timeless piece as opposed to say the the Barrows Bennett uh, Citadel of Fear, that I still think could have been written, you know, a year ago. Yes, but not just a hundred some years ago. Yes, her 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 language usage yeah. was was phenomenal. Yeah. But the yeah. but the the themes the themes in the in this book uh, really still resonate. They unfortunately, yeah, you know, they well, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, sorry. No, I, I was thinking, you know, we've got, uh, there's the this, this story Gilead with, with the, uh, the boy that is discovering his, his heritage because, you know, well, I, I can fly. Well, people can't fly. And then he's yelled at because his, his parents want to keep it, you know, keep that secret. And he's slowly discovering that he's different, but he is not fully of the people. And, and that comes into play later, right? He is, he is half of the people, which they didn't even realize could happen. And so in, uh, in wilderness, when we meet this person who has no blood relation to the people and they're like, well, you know, you're evolving into us. You're, you're becoming like us. It's this, this kind of, it's kind of a homogenized view of the universe, right? Uh, yes, there's life elsewhere and we are all the same. Uh, we're just a little bit more advanced. 
Right. Because, and I think that was Zena Henderson saying, I don't want to tell Buck Rogers stories. I don't want to, to tell bug-eyed alien stories. But also that that kind of, that goes back to, to Mormonism. Um, uh, a friend of mine who is, or a friend of ours, really, uh, Ryan, who was, who was raised Mormon, when, uh, when he was a kid, they'd all get together like, yeah, so when I die and, and, and I get my own world to be God of, I'm going to do this. And so there was, there's this feeling um, amongst at least some, because I am not incredibly well versed in the Mormon faith, um, that, that you create your own world. And so if you're creating your own world, you're doing from what you know, and more people and people and people. And uh, although, well, although how could they can be Christian and more advanced and yet from another world? Doc. Um, I mean, but, we okay. could ask Joseph Smith, but you know. Um, we could, but I don't think he's going to have a lot to say. Not these days, perhaps. So let's talk about the story you weren't a big fan of. Um, it was told from a recording instead of from a, a character who was standing in front of everybody at that last gathering because as it turned out bram had decided to go back because they found a, a ship that landed fairly recently yes but you know, for, the, the, for the telling of it was kind of lackluster. I will yeah, agree. for for a story that is sort of the 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 pinnacle of yeah the, the people's story, right? At, at, <laughs> at the time, at the time, this was like the finale of of the people, mm -hmm. and it just. I mean, I mean, if you just stop to think for a minute, when when uh, the first story of the people appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction zena henderson was not even listed on the cover right it was just eh. mm -hmm. inside the contents also then it went over because well she wasn't well known yet yeah right and but it went over really well and so the next the next like uh i think the next two issues she the people stories appeared in she was on the cover the next two stories she was the featured story on the cover and jordan appears in an issue that is the all-star with like bradbury and heinlein and all these people and it is a weak weak story and it's it's just it's a shame for all this all this building up of, mm -hmm. of recognition and renown we get to jordan Yes, yes. And now Sky 2 brings up that the stories felt very uh, generalizable. <laughs> I, I could pronounce words. Uh, because they appealed to almost everyone on any margin. You know, oh, immigrants, most certainly. religious communities, the cognitively different, or any of a whole bunch of subcultures, if you will. Well, and and hearkening back to, to Mormonism, if you look at, if you look at some of the early days of Mormonism, you look at why the Mormons ended up in Utah. If you look at the fact that until I think the 1970s, it was technically legal to kill Mormons in Illinois because the law was not off the book when they had forced the Mormons out. They said, get out or we will kill you. So, Jeez. yes. Oh, yeah. early, early Mormonism and massacres went hand in hand. And so, so there is, there is kind of that, that marginalization in early Mormonism as well. So I mean, she was really raised in, in something that, that she took and she learned from with, with her additional experiences and really wrote something that, that, yeah, I think can speak to, to anybody who feels on the outside. I think she would have been an interesting person to speak with especially after uh, all of her writings and everything. Um, well, she, I, if she was anything like her books, she was very nice. Right, very, right. Very nice. All conflict was resolved. And you know, even if there was a tense moment, it, it got wrapped up or, or dissolved even. Well, and, and there's a number of authors that came after her that, that cite her as among their inspirations and which is and the, actually pretty cool yeah and the stories they tell are certainly very different but if you if, when you look at someone's inspirations you can see bits and pieces of 
of what they've what they've drawn from uh whether it's whether it's her compassionate characters whether it yeah, i mean none of them wrote sci-fi by way of mayberry like like Zena did i really this they come on it, it really does it has the wholesomeness of like mayberry rfd um but with that really dark beginning yes I'm, which which that, is so that, jarring and i'm going to kill myself and i mean even even if that was written in the 60s which we know it wasn't it, it predates that um that was not a theme that was socially acceptable to write about well well the bridging material was written in the 60s it was it was written specifically well, for this book it, even so that was but, that was still really early it, for for something of that nature and if i hadn't gotten past the first five pages i would have been stuck with just that impression it yeah it, it was it was definitely difficult I, I i finished that and i got into i got into the first actual story i was like oh i get this this is good um yeah it's it's just it's so different but when you look at when you look at 1960s and 70s storytelling right when you look at mm -hmm. you know the twilight zone sending sending people into the cornfield and and all of the sort of low-key sci-fi um margaret st Clair's, i think it was the boy the boy who 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 sensed earthquakes the boy who foretold earthquakes um all of these oh, sort the of one that turned into the uh they use it on an episode for yeah. the night gallery yeah yeah um the, kind of these these low-key sort of sort of psychic stories i have psychic powers and in this case it's because they're alien and they have this connection to and they don't call it heaven i do they call it the, i think they call it like the home um but it, it's their connection to where they they come from and so they're not they're not afraid of death because even in death they were joined it's well, and, this... and even those that went home on the ship, they went back to the new home, capital N, the new home planet. This is this is sci-fi Narnia. That's what this is. This is if 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 uh, you know C.S. Lewis, I think would have loved this. The stories are good. The the uh, the the Christian allegories are not really allegorical, right? I mean, they, you do you do they, get the not you do get slapped about the face with yeah. it right i mean because there's no pretense right they're they christian they celebrate christmas they have christenings they, they state we are christian um but you your your statement about everything being very poignant and timely and pertinent or relevant i think is how you put it um really hit me in in one of the paragraphs right before that last story because that character leah that we don't really care for mm. did, <laughs> did she had this little inner monologue you know darkness will come again this is just a chink in my prison a promise of what is on the other side of me but how how wonderful this is you know these are people who will listen when i cry they will help me find my answers they will sustain me in the long long way that i must grope back to find myself again i might be getting a little teary she's she's definitely a, a sympathetic character it's just that she is so she's so determined to die that it's it's frustrating well, no, she, i mean certainly it's, it's realistic from, from the bleakness she at, is at the but then she's like but but then what she do she runs off to kill herself again uh i mean it's <laughs> it, and it's it's very realistic in that telling it is very realistic oh, no, no, no. when someone this, gets this to that point she, but, uh, that, but overall that passage was when she was found and brought back and, and right i finally realized and i think that that would have gone over a little bit uh, more flatly had i read it prior to 2020 fair um i mean i mean it's it's very realistic it's just i think the character is a little more realistic and dark than i would expect to read in a story that is otherwise so so homogenizedly nice right everyone is 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 so friendly and so kind and then and and yes i mean you want contrast right you want that francher kid gave us contrast but the the darkness from you, you know, the the contrast from these these happy people who are just 
Oh, they're almost angelic to, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to try again. I'm just going to keep doing this. Well, there's Go away. this troubled it's... child who wants to kill herself. And so they feel they must save her. And by doing so, they have to bring her into the hashtag not a cult. And the... <laughs> yeah. That's right. Hashtag not a cult. Um, well, which yeah. is very DCC of you. Because um, we are... We are, we are not Don't mind if I do. Stuff. But yeah, so, um, this is this is yeah. This, this was a good book. This was certainly this is certainly not what I expected when I when I sat down to read it. That's um, perfectly fair. Same it's, here. It's certainly not what I expected to uh, to uh, be be talking about on on uh, in the reading room for second quorum. Uh, <laughs> this is a, this is a lot more. It feels a lot more mundane, and not not yeah. necessarily in a not necessarily in a bad way right but but it's, it's not as as uh, gonzo and out there as this margaret th st Clair. this feels like <laughs> something i could have read in high school along with like to kill a mockingbird a separate piece and the plague right i mean this 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 certainly feels like that that style of literature that that is that is written that is is timeless and reaches out in a whole lot of ways but certainly not a whole lot of action and adventure in it. Um, we we certainly didn't have have gods fighting amongst themselves with with idols bringing monsters to life. Right, which right. I'll admit I really miss. Um, but yeah, I mean this 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 is a it's a good book. It is it's gr it's a great book that I recommend people read, but despite the fact that they're aliens and it's technically science fiction don't go into it expecting to read science fiction because it's i mean y'all have seen the covers right they're, they're not incredibly um out there and and sci-fi well there uh, is there is a spaceship <laughs> in the back by the farmhouse right Kind there of. See, yeah, see there is a spaceship but which is also nothing like what it it should look like and <laughs> Artists do do artists fail. Preaching choir, I get it. Yeah. But now I'm curious, those, those of you in the chat that have read it, do any of you have a favorite story from this? You know, are, are you like me and like Leia? Nah. Uh, you know, I mean, is there a story that really sticks out to you? Did did you like Jordan? Well, I didn't. Did you really dislike, you know, Ararat or or Gilead? I'm I am kind of curious those those of you that have read the stories because I know several people had and uh, and really enjoyed them. I'm curious as to uh, if any of them have any favorite stories. So no. while we're while we're waiting on that, Jen, what was your favorite and least favorite and we'll leave we'll leave leah out we'll leave the bridging material out we'll stick to the original stuff so the, a lot of these were claimed for their quote-unquote unchallenged positions of authority which were noted favorably by feminist critics and i don't know how i forgot this note earlier because it's important for me to point out that the teachers weren't unchallenged but maybe that was the perception back i mean back then uh practically every single story takes place in in a classroom um for jordan i will say uh or for my favorite rather jordan had one of my favorite horrific moments or or visages perhaps uh probably the the darkest thing next to the girl getting ready to jump or cut her wrist um but no i i think i'll i'll stick with uh wilderness as my as my favorite because it just that that romanticism and the lightness of it i i really that that one was that one was okay yeah that it gave me that nice, ah, okay, I can stop reading this book now feeling. And, uh, and then there was Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. And I, I, I would say that I like, like uh, King Ghidra in, in the chat, I enjoyed captivity. Uh, captivity so nails uh, th that Francher kid. It so nails you know, uh, a, a troubled, a troubled like boy, troubled preteen boy into teenage. Um, there's there's I, that I angst, there's that underlying 
there, there's that underlying anger. And I would say that, you know, it, it, oddly enough, and it, it's kind of timely, apparently, because it blew up on Twitter. Um, I was I was recently uh, in a conversation about being adopted because I, I'm adopted. And uh, I had a great experience. Um, the Francher kid is a, is, a, is a foster child whose his mother's getting money from the state and is not having a good experience. And the things that he is going through are very true to things that happen to foster children and, and adoptees when they end up in, in a family that is not really a, a family. But and then, the fact that but, she's taking money for his support and she's just spending it on herself. And so he's dressed in rags because she won't spend a penny on him. Um, and to buy him the suit, she steals from the money that he's been saving. She steals and, all of his money. No, this this is just too much like real life. Things that I've experienced, things that my friends experienced back when I was that age. And because of that sense of realism, that's why I didn't care for that story. See, as much. it was it was that sense of realism coupled with with music being his escape. That having having that escape for him really really kind of pulled me. Okay, so um, I was jealous too. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, are you like your story? Jealous that like, kid, yeah. Um, I think I think we both agree on uh, Jordan. Meh. Um, it just but, it didn't it didn't really pull me in of the elder that communicated with Bram uh, solely by telepathy because an accident had rendered her um, armless, yeah, I, legless, yeah, mute, I, and blind, and deaf. There's a Metallica <laughs> song in there somewhere. Right. But, but I mean, I just, I found that story was just a slog for me. It was, it was like, it was like slogging back through, through the first bridge piece. Like, ah, just it was yeah okay re reading it reading that that story was a chore it was it was well written but it was a chore so yes well, should we give the audience tonight a chance to answer a, a one last question well let's go ahead and ask the questions we happen to have at least one extra copy of this particular book who wants it We'll give you guys a couple of minutes to chime in there. We'll send you a book. And, you know, since, since, since the prize closet of mystery is rapidly becoming the guest bedroom of mystery, <laughs> um, why don't, we'll give out, we'll give Be out, true. we'll give out two uh, DAW collector starter kits. We'll give, Ooh, uh, we'll give, that we'll give one out to the podcast listeners and we'll give one out to the folks in the the twitch stream and that let's sounds see. like a fine plan so in, uh, in order to do that for the twitch stream uh you guys can click on the little round button below your chat where you, it shows your channel points and click on highlight my message or or something along those lines um, that, actually yeah, highlight my message would work best yeah yeah that'll stick out and just to let you know so uh while the while the uh, podcast listener uh book selection will be will be different for our for our viewers let's say we have the world of enders by lloyd biggle jr which is daw number is that six daw 15 ee e. van voigt's the man with a thousand names which is number 114 Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Forbidden Tower, which is one of the dark over stories. That's number 256. Uh, we have Neil Barrett Jr.'s Aldair Across the Misty Sea, which is number 379. A. Bertram Chandler's The Anarch Lords, which is number 449. And Hugo Award novelist C.J. Sherry's The Dreamstone, which is number 521. So if, you're, if you've ever thought like myself, God, I want a bunch of those gaw yellow spines. Um, this will this will really give you a, a good start, right? The 0 to 99, the 100s, the 200, 300, 400, 500s. And it's not that we're cleaning out things so much as that we're finding a lot of duplicates maybe. And um, while we wait to see if, uh, if we have any takers on either, you, Jen, you redeemed a random joke or random fact. All right. Do you want a I, random I, joke or a random was, fact? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Which one? Uh, a joke. We need something light. 
really? Because this wasn't very heavy. Uh, you're hitting me with a joke. Jeez, you know, I much prefer okay. you choose a random fact. <laughs> hey, Bob, let's take random fact for 1,000 points. All right, random fact, random fact. Uh, random fact about Bob, I once got to breathe fire at a biker and he liked it. That's that is that is my random fact for, for you. That's true. I should have specified new random fact. <laughs> Jen, you know most of my random facts, but but the but the uh, viewing audience likely doesn't. Good point. Good point. Oh, cute! What's the scariest tree? Bamboo. Very nice. Considering Very that, nice, Tom Cunder. Considering that we live in a in a state that actually is home to probably one of the scariest trees, the death apple, uh, which which is so toxic that not only will the fruit kill you, the smoke from burning the wood will kill you, and water running off its leaves will burn you. Um, that's, that's, yeah. that's much nicer. So, look, so you got a second topics. random fact. You got a second random fact. Um, I, I should also say for our podcast listeners or anyone catching this on YouTube after the fact, please drop us an email at thehub at sanctum.media and let us know you're interested in the DAW Collector Starter Kit uh, or just, hey, help me build my library, something along yeah. those lines. And we will do a random drawing uh, before our next show. We, we might do our, a few at this rate. Yeah, speaking of our next show, um, is this where we get our Twitch mistress to put something up on the fancy little screen? Why well, before before she I was about to say before she starts the poll, um, we, oh, have, we have uh, a poll. We we do we have a poll. We have Miriam Allen DeFord's uh, Xenogenesis: Tales of Space and Time from 1969. C.L. Moore's Jurel of Jory, who was the first female sword and sorcery uh, lead from 1934 and 1939. Mm. Lady Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World, written in 1666, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from mm -hmm. 1818. Interesting choice on that one. Mm. Yes, so. So get your mm -hmm. votes in before, I don't know how long and the poll lasts. Don't, don't forget you can weight your votes with, with channel points as well. You can indeed. Right now right now we are tied between Seal Moore and Lady Margaret Cavendish. Oh, 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 oh. there we go, there we go. Oh, 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 oh. This, is, this is exciting. It's three, three, and one. One for Mary Shelley. Can Mary Shelley come up from behind? Lady Margaret Cavendish pulling ahead with five. Mary, Whoa. As we're, as we're coming up on the, on, on the end, it is that was Lady unexpected. Margaret Cavendish's <laughs> The Blazing World, which is which is a science fiction story told in prose. So this will be, this will be an interesting read. <laughs> Get it over with, right? 16. Oh, wait, that's what Sky 2 said about Jarell of Joyery. Oh, well. Um, hmm, yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, I, I wonder who who waited that one. Um, uh, surprise alert, it wasn't me. Okay, so we'll be doing the 17th century first sci fi novel or first fantasy novel, rather. For your first uh, fantasy novel, at least by by a woman, the first fantasy story goes back to like ancient Rome. It's weird in that way. Okay, I, I will grant you that. Uh, our next show, if we are sticking to the same metric of the third Tuesday of the month, will be July nineteenth at nine p.m. So y'all got about a month. And it looks like all of our drawings are going to carry over to the podcast. Am I am I wrong on that? I do not think I am. So, uh, yeah, I think people are listening, but or possibly watching. Um, as we've learned, if you're watching Twitch live using like a television device, you can't chat at the same time on that. So, just because it shows our viewers it doesn't mean they're all in the chat at the same time unfortunately so uh between now and our next show we will give away two uh daw, co daw collector starters kits <laughs> as well as uh jen's very own copy of pilgrimage so With drop no us highlighting yeah no hi blink, hi blink. <laughs> hi don't highlight books Never write in your books unless it's with pencil. 
ask me how I know. Mm. Um, yeah. But uh, just drop us a line again at the hub at sanctum.media to get in on on the drawing. You know, Sky two, I know you're trying way too hard to go digital. See, so let me send you some books, and then when you're done, you can give them away. Free books, <laughs> free book. Favorite four letter words string together. You know, string, sorry, strung together. <laughs> Okay, now it's getting late. I, I was just looking at the book and I, I realized I can tell you exactly which used bookstore I found it at here in Florida. <laughs> so I'll, I'll put a little sheet of provenance in there too for you. So I, you know, and, 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 and our very own, our, our very own uh, behind the scenes webmaster saying, you know, she, she paid $300 you know, for, for a book. She's going to write in it. Yeah. But the key is if you, if it's a college textbook and you're going to return it, sell it back, highlight all the weird stuff as opposed to the intentional stuff, make the person that paid for that book really pay for buying that book. Right. <laughs> make them work for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there was, like there, there was a, 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 a medical program in Illinois where you'd go to the library and all the pages you needed in the medical text had been torn out by other people because they wanted to make sure that you weren't going to get the information. So, you know, just highlight the wow. wrong things in a textbook. Oh, that, that sounds like a, a, a legal school or something. So Ooh. I I think that is going yeah. to wind us down and and out for this episode. Thank you all for your patience. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> As we this run is, a little bit late. We don't have anybody after us at least. And, oh, uh, but we're going to do a thing. We are going to do a thing. Um, as as we go out, we are we are going to the Sanctum Secorum is going to launch its first raid. Hey, we're, someone raided us. So, yes, uh, yes, I did. So we're going, we're going so to. Should I paste that link in? Uh, I, I, no, uh, that nope. it'll, it'll. Okay. Elena's got it, but we are going to raid okay. twenty sides to every story who still has a, an episode going, still in progress. So um, until next month, folks, we will, we will see you then. We will discuss the next book we've read and uh, be inspired.